Welcome to Deer University, the podcast of the Mississippi State University Deer Lab. I'm Bronson Strickland. And I'm Steve Damaris. We're both lifelong hunters, deer biologists, professors of wildlife management, and co-directors of the MSU Deer Lab. We explain the latest research, including our own work and that conducted elsewhere. So if you're interested in deer biology and management, this is your podcast. Every decision you make is a step in your management program, and we give you the knowledge to make every decision count. Welcome back to the Deer University podcast. Uh, Steve and I are here. Uh, This is a part two or a continuation of our previous podcast where we discuss what we think anyway are the most relevant findings from our uh, buck movement research. And uh, in the previous episode, we we went through the publication. We couldn't get through it all. It was going to be too long. But we went through the, the publication and essentially talked about what we thought were the most meaningful graphs, how to interpret those graphs. And what we want to do today is kind of wrap that up in terms of going over the data, some more examples. And I think the theme for today, Steve, is more about uh, impacts regarding hunting. Yeah, what does exactly. Hunting, how does hunting pressure impact deer? And then what are ways you can mitigate that as a hunter or manager? Yeah, and last time, you know, we talked a lot about the basic movement ecology and what bucks were doing and how they were moving across the landscape. And, and you know, last episode was kind of helping people understand part of the story about why they may not see deer or why all of a sudden they see a deer that they hadn't seen before and, and, and understanding stuff. And, and even more so on this episode, we're going to be talking about what does it mean for hunting? Yeah. Let's fig- let's help. And have you been, uh, has your hunting success been improved by, you know, this, your involvement in this project? I would, I would like to think so. Yes. Um, had some hunting success a few days ago and uh, I would like to attribute that success. There's a whole bunch of reasons I was successful. Uh, I was on a very well managed ranch. That's number one. There were older bucks because buck age structure was taken into consideration. So a lot of stuff like that, but hunting pressure on that ranch was very low. So that's very meaningful. Bucks were moving during daylight hours freely. And the little caveat too, it was also the peak of the rut. So when does are at estrus, bucks are moving. But there was one little tidbit. I had had some decisions to make about where to hunt uh, on the last day and the next to the last day. And I had seen a buck on the very first day of the hunt, had four days to hunt. And saw a buck on the first day that I really wanted to go after. And knowing that, hoping that, I should say, that he would return to where I saw him. And so, Steve, you and I use the analogy a good bit of, and we'll talk about, show some of that today. But it's almost a circuit that a, that a buck is using, little focal areas that they're going to. And, you know, they're, they're using, on average, 200 acres a day. And so there were many, many days between day one and the last day where those 200 acres he was using did not overlap my stand. (laughs) And I was really getting nervous, but I know on the last day I had an option of, do I go over here and try something new and hope, or do I go back to where I'd been hunting him? And so I had to do the whole counterbalance. Am I wearing the spot out? you know, going back to it again. And that, that is a really a big consideration, but I just had hope that it's the peak of the rut for a couple days in a row. He was probably occupied by a doe or chasing, tending, whatever he was doing. But luckily on the last day, he did return to where I All originally right. saw him and I was able to connect. So I would like to think that some of the, the research we're, we're talking about today did indeed help me, but Maybe that's just me. Maybe well, it was congratulations. just Congratulations. We'll, t- we'll take that plug. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We'll take it. Okay. 
Well, why don't we move in? Uh, as you can see here, if you missed it on the previous episode, this is uh, an image of the cover. So you'll be able to recognize it when you see it. And I have a website up there and we'll, we'll also have a uh, QR code up there so you can point your phone at it and be able to, to download that. So let's, uh, let's jump right in. And so what we're doing here is talking about the, the end product from several years long research project looking at uh, GPS collared bucks, adult bucks. And in the last episode, we kind of ended with talking about these um, behavioral categories of how they move. And, yeah. and we talked about three different types of movement based on the, the direction and distance and turning angle and things like that. And it's all, uh, it's based on mo a model, statistical model. And we, we know that, uh, no models are absolutely accurate, but some are informative. And, and so that's the case here is we have a, a statistical model that can look at these characteristics and assign points of or location estimates to a particular behavioral state. Yeah. And we identify resting, uh, foraging or tending and walking across the country. Just walking. Yeah. yeah. Or maybe even running. Yeah, certainly. Um, and I think the way to, to maybe uh, help the listener or viewer here with this is in the previous episode, Steve, we had those movement categories like you discussed, but we had them based on uh, a category. So we had it separated by what proportion of a buck's day mm -hmm. is spent in a particular category. And we had it, I think, by time of day, sun up, midday, sundown, night. And then we had it by the phases of the rut. Yeah. Pre-rut, early rut, peak, late, et cetera. And so this is really just a an example to show you this is what it looks like. If you were to assign those categories for a particular buck, this is what it would look like bird's eye view on the landscape. Mm -hmm. And, and, and this you is can, so cool. It I is mean, cool. It's really cool. Uh I get excited when I look at this kind of stuff. Sorry. Well, you, you can also see, um, and like you said, this is a model and all models are wrong. Some are useful. That's, that's the classic, uh, statement about models, but basically on the, if it's a good model on the average, they're right. Most of the time they're right. And so there'll be some cases where it's hit or miss, but immediately you will see here, that when there are clusters of points, they typically fall into the feeding or tending category or bedding. And again, that makes perfect sense. When you see a really, really tight cluster of points, that means the buck was bedded. If the cluster of points expands out a little bit, that means the buck was moving around the landscape, but rather slowly foraging or possibly tending a doe. And then, Steve, this is the, the realization I think people need to see when you have the hopes of keeping a buck on your property, unless, it, well, any size property, bucks are always going to be vulnerable when they do an excursion. And so you'll see here these really big sweeps that they take outside of their home range. And, you know, it's tough to draw the line, but it's very easy to see one, two, three, four, maybe five at minimum excursions that that this buck took and so you can kind of visually see that and get a spatial scale that to how far they're sweeping out and that's just a great example during those periods they are out of your management influence and they are vulnerable and that's why you need to work with your neighbors and make sure y'all are on the have the same goal same yep. management theme yeah and this this clustering of points there is representative of what we were calling in the last episode sedentary bucks that that live in a single home range if if this buck were one of our mobile bucks it would be two large clusters two separate areas of clusters and these kind of uh color-coded location estimates but this is a, a sedentary buck so He's an excellent example of a buck that lives basically in one area, but makes these excursions, and in this case, quite a few excursions, and not always in the same locations. So we, we take the, the bedding information, 
from those uh, behavioral state figures. And, uh, and then we can look at the, the grouping of those locations and, and really make it interesting when we put those uh, clusters of points onto an aerial photo and you can say, hey, oh my goodness, this is where this buck has been bedding down. Right. Yeah. So I remember, Steve, when I started tinkering with this, it was several years ago. And of course, Luke took it over and did a far greater job than you or I could do even together. I, I wasn't going to point that out. But, <clears throat> but I, I remember, I think I was just looking at a weekend, maybe like a three-day time period, but mm -hmm. it had always stuck in my head over the year, you know, 20, 30 years of always hearing about, quote, a buck's bedroom and this one particular buddy bedding area that this buck was going to have a lot of affinity for. I was like, well, let's just, let's just take a look, see if that's the case. And just in that couple days that I looked at that one particular buck, there were different bedding areas all within a several hundred acre area. And so then we, I guess, uh, Luke, what he did, this is again, just a single buck. This would be buck 277 over a seven day period. And you can just see all the different places that that buck chose to bed. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine different spots over the, the seven days. And some of the places he only visited one time. So yeah. certainly not a big affinity or affinity for the buck's bedroom in that case. That's right. That's right. And some of them were more regular. And yeah. you know what striking to me, Bronson, uh, is out in the big ag field, the prevalence of, of, you know, the really the, the most visited, most regularly visited bedding sites are out in the dang ag field. And right. who would go out and I think I'll go hunt in that clump of woods out there in the middle of the field. I mean, I I'd naturally, normally under normal circumstances, before I learned all this good information, I, I would have picked a, a spot on the edge of the field. Yeah. But I've been missing out on, on the bedding sites. Let this is probably a little out of order, but I'm afraid I'm going to forget it. But I, I do want to get back to what you're referring to. And if, you, if you're on YouTube watching this, we're talking about that point at the uh, the bottom of the screen that has four, two, and one visits on it. But before I forget, let's qualify this. This is not to say if you're in a different part of the country or your landscape is different, you could have different results. And mm -hmm. specifically what I mean, if you are in an, uh, and we said in the previous episode, this is a really cool landscape for deer because it's about a 50-50 composition of forest and agriculture. If you're in a place that's 90% or more agriculture, there may be a great deal more site fidelity for bedding because of availability. Mm -hmm. There's just not a lot of options out there. So yeah, it's going to be very reliable. The, the other thing that we will get into in subsequent slides is there may be a lot of diversity in bedding just in this particular instance here because all of the cover is mediocre. So you could go in there as a manager and really make some top notch, some really good bedding, and, and it might show that there's a greater number of visits or affinity for it. But that's a little bit of an aside and a qualifier, but I just wanted to say that before I forget. So mm -hmm. look, Steve, at that, that point at the bottom where four, two, and one visits are at. What a great place you could hunt him, though. Number one, what a great place for that buck. You, you're not getting to him. You, you are going to be exposed trying to get him. So he's safe. But notice how on a, most of these points, he's not just when sundown occurs. He's not just going out in the middle of the field. Notice he's using these little cover corridors to go to the bigger woods. Yep. And that's where you got to set up. So go into Google Earth and recognizing and or maybe scouting preseason. Hey, this could be a good bedding spot. Where can I set up when he finally makes it back? And you're going to put you a lock on or a climbing stand on that, uh, that little cover corridor running north to south. Mm -hmm. Great place to get him. Yep. Sure would. And, and they'll, as we've talked about before and, and uh, 
we, we got some great videos, uh, one of which was uh, talking about these bedding site characteristics, which we're going to touch on again in a little bit. Um, th there's videos that actually show some of these travel corridors uh, between bed sites and, and foraging areas. And, and, you know, that's the key is don't try to go into the little spot where he's bedded, catch him on the way between the bed site and, and the feeding or, or tending areas. Just so happens, Steve, that is the QR codes for those, what, uh, what for those lead. videos. Yeah. So really what this is just showing here is a uh, graduate student, Colby Henderson went through and correct me if I'm wrong, Steve, on kind of the design, but it was basically we could figure out with the GPS points with the clusters where these bedding sites were. And we wanted to define the vegetative characteristics of what makes a bedding site. And so Colby was able to use some diagnostics and measurements of this is the vegetative structure and composition for a bedding site and then at random. And then he would just pick a direction and distance and go to random sites around it. And that is essentially what you see in front of you. Is that correct? Yeah, the random, not totally random. We we looked at areas that did not have any use and then selected randomly within those areas. Gotcha, gotcha. And so essentially it, it's cover, <laughs> obviously it's cover base. And the difference between the used sites and unused, there was double, around double the amount of screening cover. And one thing that stuck with me, Steve, from that was it really didn't matter the type of vegetation. It could have been blackberry. It could have been palmetto. It could have been tree seedlings. It, it could have been um, Forbes you know, a Forb mm -hmm. community, but that time of the year, it was starting to die. It was literally anything where that buck can bed down or stand up, and it's going to be very difficult to see him. Yes. And, and ideally, a bed site also is made up of some forage, potential forage plants too, but the main thing is to have some good cover. Yeah. And <laughs> one of the fun things we did when we made those videos, Bronson, you remember, we had that plastic uh, deer body. and do, do we call that a deer mannequin or is the mannequin suggested a man? It's, it's uh, a deer, deer decoy. How about that? A deer decoy. There you go. Yeah. That's the right word. And, and so we showed what the deer decoy would look like representing an adult buck in each of those spots. And it's really uh, vivid videos. And, and if somebody that hasn't seen those videos, check it out. Check out those QR codes. Yep. It ought to be an eye opener. Okay, Steve, here we have deer habitat selection. Let's walk people through this, this graph because there's a lot of stuff going on here. What we did was we didn't have some study areas with a low risk, study areas with medium risk, and study areas with high risk. We had a large study area and we knew where all the hunters were hunting, but there wasn't this distinct area that was high, medium, and low. So what we did was look at high, medium, and low risk days. So based on how many hunters were on the landscape in a given day, if it was a, and we broke it into thirds just because it was the best way to handle it. Low risk, medium risk, and high risk relative to the uh, the risk and the effort of hunting on our study areas. And generally, this is not a heavily hunted area. So our high risk is maybe a lot lower than the risk in, say, Pennsylvania on opening weekend. I mean, and, and states, you know, I used to, I grew up hunting in Vermont and Massachusetts, and you know, we had a really short season. So there wasn't a high and medium and low risk days. It was just like everybody was out for, for 10 days as much as they could. But in, in our, in our study, we broke it into low, medium and high risk to see if there was uh, some patterns of deer habitat selection. So they're, they're making a decision about where to go, what habitat type to be in. And, 
a positive value, that selection strength on the y-axis, the higher the value, the more selection for it, the lower the value, the less selection there is. So in what we've got here are the five uh, basic habitat types that, uh, or we have five basic habitat types here. Bottomland hardwoods from the right to the left, head and left, herbaceous is basically a, an old field. Heavy yeah, grass, a forest, fallow field that fallow had some field. vegetation on it, though. Yeah, yeah. and pine stand. Uh, most of the pine stands on our study areas were planted pines, and we had up some upland natural upland hardwoods, and uh, but a lot of the property was bottomland hardwoods. And then we had some crop fields, and mm -hmm. you can see that with those downward pointing arrows, the greater the risk in each of those habitat types, the less selected they were. So deer were more selective of upland hardwoods when there was less pressure in those hardwoods. If there was less pressure in the bottomland hardwoods, they would select for those. But when those bottomland hardwoods were more heavily hunted, they would have less selection for them. So those downward arrows tell me that hunting pressure matters to the selection of habitat by the deer. They avoid where you are when, when there's a lot of you out there. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's exactly right. Uh, I'll just add one thing too, just so people don't get confused because I concede it, it can be confusing. Mm -hmm. The, the Y axis and that selective strength. Don't pay attention to the, the, the number or the value just look at the, the relative relationship if one is greater than the other. And selection, I, I'm going to oversimplify this. I know a movement ecologist would probably lower their head and be shaking their head when I simplify it like this. But very, very simply, if something is selected for, that means the deer is spending more time in that vegetative type than is represented on the landscape. So mm -hmm. very simply here, if pine forests represented 50% of your landscape and deer spent 50% of their time on it, you would conclude they're not really selecting for it. Mm -hmm. So they're not choosing to spend more time there than it is represented on, on the landscape. So a little breakdown of that there. Yeah. And so, yeah. Steve, what you're seeing, though, is in every one of these cases, they're all declining. Yep. Yeah, you know, the the thoughtful and, and so many of our listeners and, and watchers are really thoughtful, sharp people. And they're going to think, well, what's the deal? Why is the right hand third of this slide covered over? Hey, oh, what do you know? There's some no. more data there. Yeah. <laughs> so the, those far the, the left hand five have a really distinct pattern associated with risk. When we also looked at summer food plots, winter food plots, and feeders, we see somewhat less of a consistent pattern. And, and it was like, oh no, this is confusing. We, we need to figure this out. But, you know, for example, in the summer food plots, and this was during the hunting season, but a lot of the summer food plots were not replanted into winter food plots. They were separate. And uh, the summer food plots oftentimes had deer vetch in it that was, you know, three or four foot high. And, and so it was providing food into the hunting season prior to the first freeze. And it was also providing some cover mm -hmm. as well. So those summer food plots uh, were probably not hunted as much as the winter food plots too. So there's, there's some explanation there, uh, even though, there's associated risk with the summer food plots, but we weren't assigning risk based on an individual location. It was on the study area. What were the heavily hunted days versus the moderately hunted days versus the low uh, pressure days? Yeah. I wanted to explain that selection strength a little bit more. So you might be thinking, well, this doesn't make a lot of sense. If, if you look at the magnitude of those bars, the data for the food plots, um, they're selecting those a lot more than they are bottomland hardwoods. And you might be thinking, well, I mean, are they bedding in the food plots? They're obviously spending a lot of time. Mm 
the way to interpret that is, is like I said a moment ago, is that food plots represent such a small proportion of the acreage on this landscape, mm -hmm. a tiny fraction of the acreage, yet there is disproportionate selection for deer to visit food plots. So that is why you see those much higher values. They're spending far more time, let's say, in bottomland hardwoods and upland hardwoods, but there's a bunch of that cover type, vegetation type on the landscape. Mm -hmm. So it's just the opposite for food plots. And just to reiterate what you were saying, Steve, too, about summer versus winter, is that this was a collection of properties that are doing it right, in my opinion, when you can, when you have the luxury of having enough acreage to do it right, is they're not planting a summer food plot and then disking it up and planting a cool season right on top of it. They're letting their summer food plots stand and then in different areas are the winter food plots. So deer are visiting the summer because there could be some remaining food there. For example, if you had standing corn or standing soybean, but in a lot of cases it was standing deer vetch which went from food and transitioned into good bedding cover. So a yeah. little more there. Mm -hmm. Before we go, let's you make believe there's a little bit of a pattern. Like in, in the winter food plots, they were more heavily selected during low risk and in the middle risk category. They were relatively less selected when there was higher risk. So there is something you know that you we you know kind of that follows the pattern from the the five on the left you know that summer food plot thing is is a little little wonky and and then the feeders it's almost like the reverse like they went to the feeders more on higher risk days but don't don't we tell people well feeders you know are attractive to deer but if if they're getting shot they're not necessarily going to go to the feeder and and you know there's issues with thinking that feeders are going to solve your problems. But, you know, looking at this data is like, well, goodness, the, the, I better hunt my feeders on high risk days because they're going to show up there. So what, how can we, how can we possibly better understand this confusion associated with the food plots and feeders? Well, I would say uh, winter food plots is demonstrating the same relationship that crops did. So it is food and no cover. And then over the progression of deer season from low risk to moderate risk to high risk, deer are learning and adapting their behavior. This is a very risky place for me to go during daylight hours because hunters are always there. Even if you're in a box blind, <laughs> That's right. they're, they're always picking it up. And then and you have to look at the, the strength of, uh, well, the selection strength is so much greater for food plots than feeders. So the selection strength to go to a winter food plot is so much more, it's well over double of what it is to go to a feeder. Now you might be saying, well, then why though there's a, it's a little, it's a subtle relationship of why are they selecting that more on the riskier days? I would say two things. Well, selection strength for the food plots went down and selection for the feeders went slightly up. And I think that's going to depend on where people put their feeders. If they put a feeder mm -hmm. right in the middle of a food plot, which a lot of people do, then you'd probably have the exact same effect as you see with the winter food plots. Some people will put it off the plot or into the woods. And so I could see deer visiting that feeder more, at least during daylight hours, than visiting the food plot at least on heavy hunting pressure days. And how can right. we possibly better understand this confusion with food plots and feeders, Bronson? We probably need to look at uh, day oh. versus night. Yes. Yeah. So here, looking at the, the confusion associated with summer food plots, winter food plots, and feeders, we see that, that much greater uh, selection strength is associated with nighttime and a much less selection strength during daytime. So yeah, the deer are using food plots and feeders in a, a little bit confusing way to potentially, but in reality, they're just using them at night. Mm 
That explains right. the fact that there appear to be selecting places where hunters are hunting, but they're doing it at night. Yeah, they're coming to it when hunters are gone. They they have patterned us. And we might even have a slide, a graph, kind of demonstrating hunter habitat selection. Might Might be here in a slide or two. I mean, that's just a gamble, but it's possible. <laughs> okay. Anything else to discuss with that slide? Uh, no, I think, I think that's the, the other, the natural habitat types, there's not a lot of variation there between night and day. So mm -hmm. what the key here is places that we build thinking if we build it, they will come. They may come, but not when we're there. Here we have... So our wonderful, wonderful, accomplished students, as well as some uh, advisors that weren't you and I, because we couldn't advise them on how to do this, uh, <laughs> but they were essentially able to run the same type of resource selection function or this selection strength value on the hunters. And so able to actually figure out what are the preferred places on the landscape for hunters, where are they going to choose? And it should come as no surprise that hunters are pairing themselves with food, with food availability. And the most obvious one there is winter food plots. Mm -hmm. And so Steve, you see that the selection strength is nine times what it is relative to the natural vegetation. And some are food plots even five times. And, and again, we know we're not talking with hunters. We're not talking about uh, a summer food plot. We're talking about the remnants of the summer food plot in December, for example. And then some of that may also be serving as cover. But that, that's where hunters went. Mm -hmm. And some of them sat at feeders, too. T two mm -hmm. times more often than they just sat in bottomland hardwoods or herbaceous or pines. Yeah. So that should also provide a, a little insight. If, uh, if you want to do, if you want to hunt somewhere on your property or lease property or public land, if you want to get away from the hunters, get away from the food plots. Mm -hmm. And, and I, th I think our next slide is, is one that I really like. It brings home the, the, the pattern that it shows brings home this, this concept. It's this mismatch between the habitat selection by the deer versus the hunters. If you look at what the hunters are selecting for, it's, it's almost like the mirror opposite of what the deer are selecting for. And I guess in this case, Steve, did you lump food plots in with fields? I believe that's the herbaceous fields, not food plots. Gotcha. Makes sense. So the story there is to, you know, to don't just hunt in the same place, move around, hunt where people aren't hunting, and you're liable to see deer because they haven't been trained to avoid that spot yet. Well, speaking of food plots, and I, I don't think we're going to win any Nobel Prizes for this finding because... Anybody that hunts knows this, but I guess we just essentially wanted to, to quantify when deer are going to food plots. And again, it, we, we found it exactly what, what you thought, what you would think. And that is uh, the least amount is during, uh, especially midday, and most of it is going to be at night. Interestingly, though, and, and again, just pointing to if you have hunted, and especially if you've hunted uh, during the rut or late season, there is still about our metric here, percent of visits, about 1% at straight up noon or at 1 p.m. And anybody that's gone to their stand early in the afternoon, it's like, I'm going to get in there at 1.30. I'm going to make sure I'm way ahead of the deer, get settled, hopefully let my scent trail dissipate, and you'll walk up there to your stand inside of a food plot and there's already deer on the plot at noon or at one. This is just validating that, yeah, there are going to be at some times deer on these plots during daylight. 
But then, Steve, you see around sunset, and I'm generalizing here because it changes throughout the year, and generally around 6 p.m. is either right before or right after. But that's where you see that biggest spike. And uh, that's people also know that when they're hunting food plots in the afternoon, especially if it's been hunted a couple times, many times, the deer will start pouring into the plot right when the sun is setting or just beyond. So there's been, there's been a couple of uh, mistakes made on deer that are seen under those circumstances. Like, oh, okay, there's a doe. It's, it's getting dark. I want to go ahead and get my doe. And oops, it was a yearling buck with small antlers. Yeah. Or a buck fawn. Yeah. So th be cautious with those late yeah. arrivers because, you know, you've trained them to be arriving late. Don't punish them for being a little bit early. What's also interesting is, uh, and this again is going to depend all on hunting pressure, how your property's set up. Is your stand directly on the plot or can you back off the plot? Are you bow hunting versus rifle hunting? I mean, there's so many little things you have to consider. But notice, too, that from 7 a.m. until 10 a.m., there's still a lot of deer using those plots in the morning. Mm -hmm. We typically think, you know, good place to hunt in the afternoon, mainly because you're going to go in there uh, before sunup or at sunup. There's deer on the plot and you accessing your stand is going to disturb the deer and they're going to run off the plot. And that will most likely happen. But mm -hmm. you could set your stand up and your access to that stand where you could do it quietly and possibly not disturb deer on the food plot in the morning. But that's just something you have to be careful. That's why so many people choose to hunt food plots in the afternoon. Uh, and, and get in those blinds well before daylight. Don't go up, yeah. you know, as the sun's coming up and climb, you know, climb in and make a racket and run off the deer, not just in the plot, but ones around it. I'll, I'm not going to say And for me, up. that is a do as I say, not as I do. <laughs> <laughs> Consecutive days getting up at four o'clock to try to get to the stand is uh, takes its toll on an old man. Yeah. And, and before we transition here, you know, one of the things that, we've talked about, I believe on the podcast in the past is the value of doing some vegetation management around the food plot. Say you have a pine stand associated with your food plot and that pine stand uh, isn't producing forage. They're just walking through it on the way to their, onto the food plot. Well, if you can manage that timber for you know, 50 to 100 yards off of the food plot and create forage underneath the trees by opening the canopy and doing some, some maybe selective herbicide if need to and prescribed fire, produce food in the woods on the edge of the food plot. Yeah, they're going to go to the food plot, but they're not likely going to be entering the food plot very early. So if you create a foraging area leading into the food plot, that's where you hunt. Yeah. So like we talked about in previous slides of where to set up, in this case, you are manipulating, you're creating a, quote, cover corridor, or in this case, a foraging corridor. Mm -hmm. And then you set up on the foraging corridor. So on their way to the plot, they're going to stop and browse, especially for a bow hunter. That's, that'd be a good place to, uh, to capitalize. But yeah. A yep. little work with a chainsaw, you can do that. All right. Timing of feeder visits. Yeah, very informative. Uh, you know, and a little redundant with what we already talked about, night versus day. But this breaks out into uh, six-hour intervals from you know midnight through 6 a.m., 6 a.m. to noon, noon to 6, and then 6 to, to midnight again, 6 p.m. to midnight. And... Uh, you know, you don't see a huge amount of daytime visits. Yeah. Two thirds, 67 such percent. So two thirds of the visits are at night and the, the remaining third would be during daylight hours. So in terms of a high probability place to, uh, to see deer and hunt deer, it, it has a much lower probability. Yeah. Oh boy. <laughs> 
Oh yeah, this is one of your favorites, and and I'll tell you what, uh, our friends and colleagues and listeners, I get a lot of grief around here sometimes. Uh, sometimes, I and maybe some others, <laughs> you know, firmly believe that the moon phase affects movements of deer, and and uh, I've tried to prove that to Bronson, who has somewhat of a doubting spirit about him. Uh, and he keeps showing me data that doesn't prove what I think I know. And and this is another one of those figures, and I'm just going to get out of the way and let you show how much you know as opposed to what little I know. Well, Steve, you might want to provide the the context of why you thought and or continue to think that is the years and years and years of you working in graduate school with MDWFMP and then maybe again in Texas later, but mm-hmm. you were doing nighttime deer collections. Yeah. And so you were sh- shooting deer to collect them for scientific purposes. Yes. And also just doing spotlight counts too. Yeah. Just observing and counting deer. And typically we would, and this is something I I'd, I'd kind of learned to my greatest extent in Texas doing spotlight counts and collecting. And then also when I came back to Mississippi in in 97, you know, the agency guy said, no, we do not collect deer. We do not even try to collect deer two two or three days before and two or three days after a full moon because it affects their movement. We're not going to see, we just know from experience, we're not going to see as many at, at night when there's a full moon. And, and this, you know, a lot of hunters say, oh, man, the deer are active at night because there's a full moon. Uh, and that's why I don't see them in the daytime. Well, I've hunted in the daytime and spotlighted at night, literally in the same areas as as opportunity has allowed me to over the years. And you don't see them necessarily in the daytime or at night around a full moon based on that kind of anecdotal individual observation and that's one of the problems with any hunter that believes they know something and i believe i knew something and some of the agency biologists said they knew something but dang the data (laughs) well you you said something a, a moment ago that's i think is rather enlightening um I, I probably and, said, se- hopefully I said several things that were enlightening over the last 20 minutes. Let, let's keep it at one thing. There okay. was that one, <laughs> there was that one thing you said in all seriousness, you said <laughs> when you started working with those particular people back in the day, we're not going to go out and do collections on day of the full moon or a day or two prior or whatever. So you, you censored your data collection. Mm-hmm. So self-fulfilling prophecy, if you're not putting the same amount of effort every single night and recording what you saw, then, yeah, you you don't see them on the full moon, not because the deer weren't there, it's because you didn't go. All right. (laughs) So here's this graph. It's rather busy. Let me try to walk through it on our on our Y axis. Let me see if I can get. Yeah, the left-hand side y-axis. The left-hand side, up and down. That is distance traveled in yards. Notice we have two lines here. We have three lines, but there's the the squiggly blue line. That's going to be the daily average uh, distance traveled in yards. The nighttime. For nighttime, and then the orange line is during the day. So every single day we divided up the the number of movement steps during between sunup and sundown and then sundown and sunup. And we put them in those two categories. Is this nighttime movement or daytime movement? Take the average of all those bucks every single day and plot them out. And this is what you see. Then corresponding with that, the little you see the, the gray line, that is the moon phase in terms of going from a full moon to a new moon. And you see the oscillation there going in and out, in and out. And what you'll notice is the only reliable change in deer movement that happens is not related to the oscillation of the moon phase. It's related to the rut. Mm 
Mm -hmm. And so we see that both the nighttime and daytime movements just about double or more than double during no rut to get to pre rut. And, and Hey, I'll give somebody this. If someone wants to scrutinize that and say, well, yeah, but, but right after the full moon, you see that they, the deer went from, I'll do, I'll use a, a daytime value. They went from moving 1500 yards a day to 1600 yards a day. Okay. If that's what you want to read into it, that it was another hundred yards a day, you know? Um, and if you think that's going to make a big difference, then believe the moon theory all you want. But again, when you step back and look at the amount of ground they are covering per day, and then you put the moon phase on top of that, there's just really nothing there. And I have looked at this and I've looked at this. And so again, as a hunter, when I look at this, there's a lot of stuff like we talked about earlier that I glean as a hunter and say, wait, number one, I could use that. Number two, we need to tell people about it. When I look at these data, I, I have no such reaction at all. There is variation there day to day on sure. average. Yeah, and, and some of those, you know, the, to use your, your, the daytime values you mentioned, you know, there's some days, one day to the next is a 500 yard difference in, in movement. So you'd think, well, something's going on there. But we've looked at a lot of different environmental variables, weather patterns, rainfall, temperature, cloud cover, frontal activity. And other people have looked at those same variables too. And, and there's just no clear, consistent metric that says, yeah, this is the day you need to hunt. There's no reliable pattern. There's no reliable pattern. And yes, yeah, Steve, you, there are. The line is squiggly and not straight. There is some day-to-day -day variation. And as we talked about a few slides ago, that could simply be numerical. It could simply be that on that particular day, there was one or two bucks that did an excursion. Mm -hmm. And so they inflated that daily value, even though we're taking the average of all those different bucks. But if you had one that uh, during the distance traveled at night, it covered 10,000 yards versus 3,000 yards, that could increase the average for that day. And so th there's a lot of little reasons like that. But the main thing is look at the pattern you see. And there is no pattern to where either the blue line or the orange line is moving up and down in synchrony with moon phase. Okay, so I want all of our audience, if, if you're like me, raise your hand and say this, this graph is frustrating because it, it doesn't agree with what I already thought. And, and I bet there's several people raising their hand right now. <laughs> if I hadn't believed it, I wouldn't have seen it. Now, let me, um, not to belabor this, but let me add one more distinction, because when we put this graph on social media a while back, th there are different categories of the moon's supposed influence. One of them is the phase regarding the, the luminosity, you know, mm -hmm. of a full moon versus new moon. The other is the position mm -hmm. of the moon. Where is it at in the sky? Is it overhead, underfoot, moonrise, moonset? We have yet to analyze that. That's on the list. Want to do that? We'll get to it soon, I hope. Um, but we're not speaking to that. This is just the moon illumination phase here. Yeah, and, and our database, you know, we, we've sent this publication to press because it was time. You know, this data, this set of a million locations is kind of like a herd of dairy cows. We're going to be milking this thing for a while. So here again, this we've got the website here and the QR code. So please download it, look through it. Hopefully it'll bring up a lot of thoughtful discussion with hunters and managers, probably bring up some spirited debate at, at the hunting camp. And as Steve alluded to, we're not done. I mean, it was just finally time to compile everything we had completed so far, get it in a publication and get it out. But Steve, we've already have had several additional ideas. 
And I don't know if we'll do part two to this publication or a completely different publication, but all that to say more to come. Yeah. And, you know, this kind of a simmering, simmering all of this information down into a couple of really general statements is, you know, never say never, never say always. You think you know what the deer are going to do. They won't necessarily do it. They will on occasion. And if you have that occasion enough times, you're going to believe that, oh, well, that's the definitive thing. But there's so much variation among the population of adult bucks, the different personalities and why they might be moving. And, you know, heck, I'll get one more story about uh, Buck 140, the, the buck that swam the Mississippi River. Sometime uh, after we caught him before he went to uh, Louisiana, he stopped moving for like a week. And, and we were getting these locations and we, oh my goodness, he must be dead. And we didn't get a mortality indicator or, or, well, I think we actually may have gotten a mortality indicator that the collar hadn't moved much. And, and so uh, Luke went down to, to collect the collar and walked into the, this heavy cover area where the collar was and the collar jumped up and ran away and then subsequently <laughs> swam Mississippi, Mississippi River three, three times. Uh, before finally being recovered. So deer bucks do stuff that you just don't know. And uh, this, this research project, this document just helps you understand the breadth of variation in a population of deer. And uh, yeah. we're, we're blessed when we can see a guy like on, on the photo of the, the cover there, just uh, in a, in a harvestable situation that we could actually take advantage of. Yeah. And another good point wrapping up, j just to reiterate, there's always going to be individual deer that do weird things that don't follow the pattern. Mm -hmm. But the data we have presented to you here is all using population averages. So the patterns that we think you can bank on, but that's not to say you're not going to have an, an individual deer do something very, very odd. That's always going to be the case. Well, I can't wait till the next full moon. I'm going to go hunting. And, and if I don't see any deer, Bronson, it's going to be because they weren't moving that day. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if you limit yourself to not going during the full moon, I promise you, you won't, won't. see them. That's during right. The full moon. That's right. Okay, Steve. I think that's where we're going to wrap up. I enjoyed it. Likewise, as always, it's, it's uh, great working with you, Bronson and, and our great, uh, graduate students and research cooperators, agency biologists and, and landowners that allow us access to their land and support our research. And, and oh, how about a plug? It's, it's like the end of the year. If somebody wants to have some fluid cash that they need to donate to something, could they donate to the MSU Deer Lab? I, I don't see why not. Well, of course they could. And they could go to our, our website and there's actually a donate button there that will take you to a form and allow you to do so. And if you choose to do so, it is very much appreciated and it will be used to produce things like you are either listening to or watching. So we thank you very much if you do that. That would be the msudeerlab.com website. That's correct. Okay, well, thank you everyone. Good hunting, everybody. Happy hunting. We thank the Patrick F. Taylor Foundation and the St. John and Dudley Hutchinson families for their endowed financial support of our efforts. We also thank our employers, the Mississippi State University Extension Service and the Forest and Wildlife Research Center. If you have questions or suggestions, please log on to msudeerlab.com and click on the Deer University tab.